Welcome to the Poisoner's Cabinet. I'm Sinead. And I'm Nick. And this is your weekly podcast exploring the lives of the great poisoners and macabre murders from across the centuries and creating curious cocktails inspired by the tales that we tell. And it's episode 65. 65. Five. 65 Hurrah for 65 Hooray for continuing to do episodes and counting every single week in wonderment We are getting good We are it's getting impressive. good it's a thing that we do every week and we can't stop now. Can't stop it now. No, it's become habit. We would not know what to do with otherwise. Indeed. How are you, Nick? I'm all right. Yeah, all right. I'm all right. Can't complain. Can't complain. It's all good. Bumble along. How are you? Are you well? Oh, 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 this is one of the rare occasions where you've ever asked me back. Very rare. Very rare. I thought we've hit the 60s. It's about time. I, I, I'm I, fine. I'm fine. Bored now. <laughs> Sometimes I feel things, Nick. No, okay. <laughs> no, we don't do that. I'm very well. I was <laughs> at work. Uh, I had a networking session. It involved beer tasting. Virtual beer tasting. Virtual beer tasting. I'm I'm imagining that you were tasting virtual beer. <laughs> yes. There was, you were going, oh, I can imagine the hops. It was a networking session of mimes and we were <laughs> Just all fake tasting beer going, mmm, mmm, this is the same. No, 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 we got a little package delivered, so I was able to taste some beer from a very good brewery. Sounds like some fancy marketing nonsense to me. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you think I work in this industry? Though I will say, I did have the opportunity to try something you tried recently. I don't know if it was on the main episode, I think it might have been on Patreon. Yeah. This marketed hard seltzer business bit, bit. that is a thing that is evil and needs to die in a pit entirely unnecessary what is that about i have no idea it's just like, it's sparkly water make it boozy no it's just water and vodka though it's not even just, good booze yeah, it's no, awful does anyone else out there like hard seltzer are we missing something i don't think we are if no. you like it we don't like you <laughs> That's a slightly dramatic approach, possibly, but, um, but yes. uh, a valid one I stick with. Yeah. Indeed. Well, any poisonings this week? Hard seltzer related or not? Hard seltzer related or no, no. I mean, well, anyone who I see with a hard seltzer is going to get poisoned. Do you knock it out of their hand or do you just let no, it No, no, I, I have a handy stash of strychnine in my bag that I will surreptitiously <laughs> dose a hard seltzer if I see one. Not a court in the land would convict you. Absolutely not. Uh, they, they'll go, well done, sir, well done. We, you did the right thing. <laughs> <laughs> but other than that, hard seltzer related, it's all been fine. I believe so. I believe so, yes, indeed. The world is at peace. Hooray. Well, speaking of poisoning people in the street and, and striking drinks out of people's hands, I think it's time for us to thank our lovely Patreon subscribers. Because they would never do that. They would never strike someone's drink out of a hand. And they wouldn't touch a hard seltzer, would they? Would they? Quite right. So thank you so much to Alexandra Phipps. To Jade Ariel Clark. To the Pink Witch. We love you because I love your name. <laughs> and to Tash. Excellent. Thank you so much, you delicious, lovely new subscribers. Subscribers, you're very, very sexy. Hope you're enjoying all the exciting ramblings that there are on Patreon. There are many of them. There are many and they're wonderful. Oh, but you delved into our first gunslinger story this week. Oh, you did. It was very exciting. You did. You dipped your toe into the old, old west. Way, the old west. Which is a misnomer because the old west actually involved a lot of the east in that story as well. <laughs> You're just going to go, it's all old and kind of vaguely westy. Uh, well, it's sort of centrally, really, isn't it? Florida. There was a bit of Florida, but there's a lot of Texas. It was mainly Texas-based. Texas. Yeah, okay, fair enough. South. The old south. <laughs> which is a godless place, as we know. <laughs> it's all very complicated. Well, Nick. Yes? Are you ready? No. To drink cocktails and talk about poison? Oh. Oh. Mm. More. Mm. We could drink poison and talk about cocktails. Let's have a cocktail, I think. Yay! Cocktails. I am so ready for a cocktail this week. <laughs> when are you ever not ready for a cocktail, dear? I've had one of my famous weeks of not drinking for two days, so now I'm just... I think famous is pushing it slightly, I have to say. Among my AA group, it's famous. <laughs> the police know of it well. <laughs> Sinead has not had a drink for two days. It is cause for celebration throughout the land. The authorities know that it's a full moon tonight and Sinead is having a drink. God, bring in reinforcements. <laughs> yay, yay. We're going to go with the first one. We're going to have a cocktail. We're going to talk about poison. Hooray. Hooray, hooray, hooray. And it is Nick's story this week. Woohoo! Aren't you lucky? We are, but we can't, we can't, we can't possibly have a story without a cocktail in hand. As you know, every week we pick a secret ingredient that is inspired by the tale that we tell that will flavour our cocktail of the week. So Nick got to choose our special secret ingredient. And it is, Nick. And it's very sparkly. It's very lovely. Mm. We have some Diamonds. 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 How splendid. I was so excited when you sent me diamonds as a secret ingredient. <laughs> I just went through all of the diamond songs in my head. <laughs> diamonds are forever. Yep. Shine bright like a diamond. Diamonds are a girl's best friend. 
Diamond in the in the hand. That's another one. I don't know. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, we've got three so There's far. Three. One Sinead made up. <laughs> There's three Diamond songs, and that's the end of this anecdote. I do believe there's an Aladdin thing going on there. Diamond in the Rough, is it? Yes, is isn't it, that a song? Is that? Wasn't yes, that someone commented on that. Is, oh. it was, is it? I don't know. There's going to be silence now as we think back to the Disney film. Or is it a new one? No, no, it's, it's, it's definitely referred to. If it's the name of a song or something, I don't know. But it's definitely the Diamond in the Rough. Ah, ha, ha. Is this anything to do with Aladdin? Not in the slightest, no, not in the slightest. <laughs> so, yeah, so that was all bollocks, really, so... <laughs> Everyone was probably listening along, shouting at the um, whatever they're listening to podcasts on. The gramophone. Yes. Oh, can we release a podcast on vinyl every week? <gasps> Let's do that. I'm sure that'll go down a treat. Oh my God. There's got to be a market in it. There's got <laughs> like to be season, a market. Like season one on Poisonous Cabinet Vinyl. <laughs> That's what all the Patreon money will go towards. The extortionate costs of us pressing <laughs> vinyl every week delivered to five people so they can sit in their wingback chairs swilling a brandy or a chocolate milk, whatever it is you want, going, oh yes, it does sound better on vinyl. Yeah, it's the quality. It would be like a, a Patreon tier of about $5,000 a month or something. People would um, pay for it. People would go for it. Well, if there's interest out there, let us know. Indeed. Imagine the quality of <laughs> me screeching and nick drinking every week well it's a delight diamonds though diamonds it's so it's so yes, elegant it's so diamonds. fancy are the, are the diamonds in the drink i'm fancy and i'm pretty i deserve nice things <laughs> you're not fancy enough i feel you're not gonna do that romantic thing where you drop a like a diamond ring in the drink and then oh my god no <laughs> no, no, I'm not going to do that. Killing that idea dead, aren't you? Yeah, absolutely. That, that, uh, no, 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 I think not. Perhaps one day, a lump of coal, maybe one day. <laughs> That's what I'm worth to you, isn't it? Even if we were a couple, you'd be like, yeah, you're not worth diamonds, love. No, perhaps a shiny pebble. <laughs> oh, I'd actually really like a shiny pebble. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> a little crow brain would be going, oh, pebbles, 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 pebbles. Oh, shiny. <laughs> I'm easy to please. Hooray, hooray, hooray. So with diamond then as the inspiration, the ingredient, I wish it was an ingredient, what have you come <laughs> up with? Well, see, there, there, there are quite a few things out there. And I thought, oh, let's do something diamondy. Perhaps some sort of a bubbly thing. Something Ooh. with some fizz oh, yeah, might be yeah, good yeah. for a diamond thing. Someone on uh, the social also mentioned as well like a really crisp ice cold martini oh yes but quite diamondy sort of things so it's got that really pale color and all frosty yeah. and lovely that's quite got quite a diamondy vibe to it i like the way people are thinking out of the box with this and sort of visuals that you know the crispness yeah. of, a, of a cold martini but we're not having that either so. oh, oh fuck <laughs> right, okay so this week we're having a black diamond a black diamond a oh. black diamond as an evil diamond an evil <laughs> diamond for an evil story a lot of diamonds are evil actually really by nature <laughs> this i hope yes. this was a sustainably sourced diamond absolutely black From diamond my cupboard. yes <laughs> <laughs> oh it sounds decadent yet with a twist of evil oh i think potentially just evil oh just evil just evil potentially yes are there black diamonds can you get a black diamond in real life i don't know if you can get i don't know if you can get a black diamond in real life i'm not too sure no that's that's just a bad diamond yeah that's a, that is just coal really <laughs> someone's trying to because <laughs> it's, it's made of the same stuff it's all carbon in the end i wonder if anyone's ever done that <laughs> just gone here is a lump of gold it's a black diamond it rubs on my skin that's the purity <laughs> of it it's fresh from the ground where it was it's grown. exfoliating it's great <laughs> chew on it it's weird so yes so we have one of those to look forward a black to. diamond i love the sound of it it sounds like our cup of tea hopefully it damn well better be yeah well, as ever, Nick has delivered me some secret ingredients. So I think without further ado, we need to go to our isolation kitchens and shake up a storm. So we'll see you in a minute. We'll see you in a bit. And we're back. Hello. Oh, Nick, it's another brown It's another drink. brown. It's, it's, another an, it's not exactly black. I was hoping for a slightly blacker, a blacker hue, but... Um, no, it's um definitively brown. It's positively amber. Well, yes. It's very ambery, so I I'm, I'm intrigued by it. Amber, gold, golden, almost. Mm. A black diamond though, is it? Mm. I don't think we should drink mm. it until there's blackness in it. Get some Guinness. Okay, okay no. Introduce it to your soul. <laughs> Well, would you like the knife back or should I leave it in my heart? No, just leave it there. It's fine. I'll come back for it later. I have nothing to come back with. <laughs> just tears. So a black diamond. It looks very black beautiful. Diamond. Obviously, we can't, we can't, we can't discuss what's in it until I no. tasted it. So do we have a little sniff first then? By all means, okay. sniff away. It smells of booze. I'm getting hints ah, of booze. Hints of booze. Hints of booze. And... Notes of alcohol. Well, that's it. We don't need to taste it anymore. We've sorted it. But I'm going for it. Okay, right. Let's dive in and taste it. Merry Christmas. Ooh. Ooh. 
Ooh. Ooh, I say. <laughs> Ooh. That's all I have to say on the matter. Yes. I feel like you like it. I do like it. Mm. And much more than I was expecting to. It's boozy. It's oh, it's definitely nice. Yeah, hang on a second. Hang on a second. Ah. What are those flavours in there? What are those flavours in what, there? What are those flavours? Oh, I don't know if I can work that out. Can I have a guess at what's in there? Mm. Now, okay, full disclosure, you did mention to me that some cacao is in there. I did, but it's not. Oh, it's not? Because that was for an alternative drink that I did not make. Oh, okay. Well, then, then I didn't taste any of that. <laughs> 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 yeah, the, all the way through tasting that, I was like, oh yeah, I can so taste the cacao. Yeah, yeah, really getting notes of that. <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> no. Notes of chocolate. <laughs> no, 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 no. If you are, you, you're, you're having a stroke or yeah, something. Exactly, <laughs> it's a cry for help. Hmm, hmm, hmm. Oh, I don't know now. I don't know, I'm thrown. We have three ingredients. But three? Three things. But three things in this drink. Uh-huh. Come on, you can get one. You can get one. Okay, uh, maraschino. No. Fuck. Whiskey. Bourbon. Nope. Cognac. Yeah. Yay! <laughs> You're really rattling through that bottle of cognac, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> We've used a lot of it recently, actually. I'm, I know. not being a fan, it's actually come up in a few cocktails that I've quite enjoyed. So I'm still not that much of a fan <laughs> yet. Okay, so cognac. Uh, uh, I really don't know the yeah, rest. I think you might struggle with the rest of them. Okay, go for it. So we have uh, a sweet vermouth. So you may have got that one. Oh, okay. Obviously the colour, which would usually be the dead giveaway, masked slightly by the cognac. And one which I don't think you'll get, but you would not, you would notice if it wasn't there. You've got elderflower. What? <laughs> elderflower? Which, elderflower. The Saint, Saint-Germain elderflower. Oh, the Saint-Germain. All right. Oh, God. Now you've said it. So, I'm not just making this up, but now smelling it. That's what it is. That's I the thing that I couldn't work out. Would be noticeable with his absence, but this actually is not overpowering, as elderflower can sometimes be. Yeah, I'm not a fan of the elderflower. Mm. I think elderflower is overused in bloody everything. Elderflower cordial, elderflower cordial, elderflower this. No, it's evil. Don't like it. Not not a fan for the elderflower. But <laughs> but it makes a damn good cocktail. I can't taste it in there. It's okay. It's this certainly boozy. I'm going to say that the cognac cocktails are down the middle for me fair enough because i don't think you can really mask the cognac very well no no you can't absolutely all the other flavors are doing is just i can taste the red vermouth i can now you said the saint germain i'm glad i can't taste a lot of that but it gives a little floral something yeah, to it in the background absolutely. so so clearly a really really good cocktail and a really good mix but cognac is just such a powerful flavor that it's for me it's just it doesn't give enough complexity i just feel like it's overpowering it Fair enough. There's an intervention, Nick. You need to stop with the cognac cocktail. <laughs> well, there've been like three, and it tears me up inside. <laughs> there, because there were alternatives that we could have had, and one which we so very, 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 very nearly okay. had, which was called uh, a diamond back. Well, diamond. Oh, like a snake. Like a snake. Yeah. It, it's it's poisony. It's poisony. It's poisony. It would have been great. Uh, yes. You would have exploded. Because it has your favourite ingredient. Chartreuse. It has the yellow chartreuse. So I thought, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to be nice to Sinead. I regret it bitterly. Oh, no, thank you. Well, what else with this <laughs> yellow chartreuse would have been in there? So on that one, uh, it was rye whiskey. Nice. Uh, Calvados. And we had some Calvados left over from previous uh, week. And yellow chartreuse, so another three-ingredient cocktail. I, I don't feel like I'm missing out on that one. <laughs> Didn't think you would enjoy this one. So the cognac cocktail, mm-hmm. it's nice for what it is. Nice for what it is. Oh, damning with faint praise there, indeed. I do like it. I'm not I'm, I'm still going to drink it, and I'm not going to object to <laughs> drinking it. How do you feel about them? Do you, are, you, are you, like, more into cognac now? Are you, I'm is certainly it... more into them than I... Yeah, than I usually. I would. I would still would not. I would not drink or have a nice glass of cognac of an evening as a digestif or something. See, I would. But I think in a cocktail like like that, I think where it's mellowed down, I think the sweet vermouth really mellows it and adds an extra layer to it. And I think the elderflower is surprisingly lovely in there. You you don't know it's elderflower, but you know there's something in there. <laughs> That's a great description. You know something's in there. <laughs> I mean, it's not overpowering as elderflower. No. But if it wasn't there, you would know something was missing. You have to taste the notes that are not there. It's like jazz. Exactly. <laughs> You're more of the hard liquor. I say hard liquor. Everything's hard liquor. But the, you know, the. I'm more of the short, desperately boozy cocktails. Yeah. Yes, those are my those are, preference. Yeah, that's your forte. That's your that's your happy place. Whereas I would be more inclined to have a cognac or a Calvados or a whiskey, not bourbon. Bourbon's lovely in cocktails. I'm really into those now. But all the other ones, I'd be more like, yeah, a little little digestive, little sw- mainly so I can sit in my big chair and swill the glass and cackle. I do that anyway, but with a Negroni, <laughs> swilling it all over you. <laughs> yeah. His evil schemes are not so subtle. Yes. Well, I think it's a lovely drink. It's a lovely drink. It's another con- another one for the cognac drinkers. Again, tell us people what do you think of it. Next week, more fruity, sharp 
sour deliciousness from you. Okay, well, I want a, a fruity shop's sour delicious ingredient then from you next Oh, week. yes, I suppose. What could that be? Apart from limes. <laughs> <I> have to <laughs> so, find something with limes in it and then you can't escape me. Bring it on. I've got a... Oh, we haven't had a last word. That's a good limey one. Oh, that is a good one. That does have chartreuse in it, though. It does mm-hmm. have chartreuse in it. Well, you have to pull out the big guns. <laughs> yes, maybe the ingredients next week will be bitterness. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, Campari. <laughs> <laughs> That's another Negroni for me. <laughs> How many Negronis have you had, Nick? Oh, many, many. And I wasn't sure if this cocktail would be good, so I made a jug. Yeah. <laughs> Did you actually make a jug of Negronis? He's just shown me it on camera. A mixing, a mixing glass. Of oh, oh, yes. There's such a subtle freaking difference, it's, it's, isn't it's there? It's not quite a pitcher. It's not quite a... I've got, I've got a bucket of Negroni down here. Two for one of Negroni pitchers. Oh, my God. Well, with our black diamonds in hand... Is it time for a story, Nick? Yes, everyone is ready. Are you ready at home? So this week, this week, I've gone back to the beginning with a good old fashioned poisoning. So I know you've done a few recently, but I realise I haven't actually done a poisoning case since our Borgia Medici face off at the end of season one. So that must be remedied. Must be rectified. So today we have just that with the tale of Anna Marie Han. Ooh, that's a woman. Well done, yes. I'm way ahead of this story. <laughs> we start our story in Germany. Okay. In 1906. So Anna is the youngest of 12 children. Jesus. Yeah, indeed. Big old family going on there. But it is noted that she is a incredibly difficult child um, and has earned herself, even at a very young age, quite the reputation for, for stealing Ooh. and for taking other children's toys when they were better than hers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you're the youngest of 12, is she just taking her... Well, not just her siblings' toys. <laughs> no. But, like, people at school, little kids at school and stuff like that. And just everyone going, no, I like that. Push them over, steal their toy, steal their doll and, and run off cackling. Youngest child, are you spoiled so you should get the best or is she suffering from having the hand-me-downs from all the other kids never having anything new so she wants to take well, something for her own who knows i mean the family is relatively well off um her father is a cabinet maker millionaire he's a skilled and well-paid profession but nothing is ever good enough for the young anna she always wants more and it doesn't really matter to her how she gets it at the age of 19 Anna falls pregnant. <gasps> she claims the father was Dr. Max Matschecki, a Viennese physician who was going to marry her and take her away to a better life. However, there are no records of any such doctor <laughs> in Germany <laughs> or Austria. Most likely she invented this th- suave and dashing and wealthy doctor. Mm. But to this day, we have no idea who the father of Anna's child actually was. Oh. But it didn't matter. Her family are utterly horrified by such a, such a scandal to have a pregnant unwed mother going around no. no not not for their little baby no terrible terrible thing and as soon as uh, her son oscar is born anna's parents swiftly arrange for her to be sent to america to stay with an aunt and uncle who live in cincinnati okay that's that's far out of sight perhaps out of mind the community the neighborhood will forget about this terrible stain on the the honour of the family. Get rid of her, send her far, far away. Well, send her far away when she's had the baby. Send her over there, sh- I mean, yes. not, it's not right, but send her over there surely while pregnant. So no one has no, to know. No. After, after the baby. So off she goes. In 1929, uh, she makes her way to the States, leaving poor Oscar in Bavaria with her parents. She settles into her new life in Ohio. Wait, she, the kid was left with the parents? The kid is left with the parents. What? And then she's sent away? And she is sent this away. This is weird logic. Perhaps they pass the kid off as one of the, the other siblings' children, maybe. The baby's fine, but she's shamed and she has to go to America. Okay, well, yes, she, absolutely. Okay, fair enough. Maybe, well, as you said, she's obviously had more problems than just having a baby. Well, the, well indeed mm. so. An excuse to push her away. Right. And she settles into her new life. Um, and it's not long before she meets philip han at a, at a very jolly community dance <laughs> and the two fall madly in love and they get married in 1930 so less than a year after she arrives and they've met they marry 
Now, Philip is well aware of Anna's son over in Bavaria. That's not news to him. She has told him that she was, in fact, married in Aww. Germany. But her husband passed away, and that's what caused her to move to the States. So she was, she was in fact, a widow. Glamorous, sexy widow. And such things are entirely acceptable. There's no Facebook back then. You can't just go and stalk people. No, well, exactly. He can't check these things out. He has to take yeah, her word Yeah, she can make it. up anything. And why would you lie about such a thing? For many, many reasons. <laughs> Lying <laughs> solves all of your problems. <laughs> well, quite. After the wedding, they, in fact, make the trip back to Europe to meet the in-laws and to, to collect Oscar and bring him back to the US Good for to them. live with, with Philip and Anna. Now, Philip works as a telegraph operator, a job he absolutely hates. Oh. And he cannot wait to get out and have a, build a better life for him and his new family. And the couple save and they save and they save. And eventually they have enough money to start their own business. And they open two bakeries in Cincinnati, specialising in bringing a, a taste of home to all the German immigrants that are coming across from Europe. Oh, nice. They're making lots of sort of European uh, German breads and pastries and things like that. Um, a, bit, a nice, a nice yeah, taste, taste of home for these, the, these immigrants who are missing all these sorts of things oh yes lovely pastries oh that's nice absolutely. i like that delightful absolutely it isn't that everyone's dream open up a little cupcake shop well it certainly was phillips however there's one thing that anna has not bargained on her husband actually expects her to work how very very rude <laughs> anna's expectations of, of staying home looking after her son but then going out and buying nice shiny things has not quite worked out the bakeries are doing well but it's not an easy life it's a hard life running two bakeries yeah you're up early in the morning uh, preparing all the bread and everything like that bakeries you have to get up at like 4 a.m it's an incredibly tough life and she's the one who knows all the taste of europe surely he, he is also a german immigrant oh um, right Philip oh, is also from me. from germany but he is the one in the bakery she is the one on the the shop counter mm. sort of doing the doing the serving and perhaps some admin and all that sort of thing keeping the books and it is really not what not up her street not what she was expecting at all she finds it dreadfully boring mm. there must be a, a much 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 easier way of making money than this arson arson that's easier what <laughs> <laughs> i mean she's just someone who doesn't like mornings you yeah, just someone who doesn't like working really <laughs> yeah i mean you could just sit there all she has to do is at the front and just take some money but if she's getting up at 4 a.m like oh my god this is so boring yeah people can i have a loaf of bread oh my god what do you want from me people why do they come to me and her husband's probably out the back there in the bakery actually making the stuff she's got to then sort of grow all like the delivery boys who are taking stuff to Ooh. other places and things like that she's got to organize all that a lot of admin and paperwork and ugh. no one has ever suffered as she has no one has ever suffered so her solution is fire. Fire is obviously the, <laughs> the best way out of all of this situation. But she starts with a, with a small fire, a wee tiny fire. A match. At one of the bakeries. Okay. Now, it doesn't do too much damage, but still she gets $300 from the insurance company mm. not too bad for a night's work not too shabby no one suspects a thing got away with that one two further fires follow these are both of the home that she's in fact her inherited from her aunt and uncle mm. that she went over to live with they have since passed and left her a lovely lovely house now neither of these other fires did major sort of structural damage but she is still able to collect over two thousand dollars from the insurance company tasty. tasty tasty sum of cash so she's thinking insurance fraud this is the way forward <laughs> this is the way to go and she starts she starts looking around for other things that she can insure for lots of cash <laughs> and her eyes fall upon her her dear beloved husband <laughs> swilling your yeah. cognac in your chair okay that armoire that could fetch a pretty penny the credenza <laughs> that could be oh hello philip he's huge all his body parts move he must be worth millions <laughs> now Twice she attempts to persuade him to sign off on a $25,000 life insurance policy, but he outright refuses. Now, we don't know if perhaps he thought it was tempting fate. <laughs> if he was, as, as many people did, it was, a, it was, like, it was almost a slightly superstitious thing. If you always ensure this, then sort of signing your own death warrant sort of thing. Yeah. Or even if for fact that he had some suspicions about his wife's motives, perhaps obviously knowing the fires that had happened previously. Yes. Is he maybe slightly dubious about what was going on? But either way, he refuses. It feels like he is quite smart in this relationship, that several things have burnt down. She smells of smoke, is just flicking matches as she walks around the house and then just turns up one day really close up into his face going would you sign this life insurance policy i'm totally <laughs> sure you'll be fine be fine it'll all be work out for the best why have you brought this up now no reason 
whatsoever. <laughs> yeah, um, don't blame him for backing out of the room very yeah. slowly. She is not at all happy by his refusal on this. She burns more shit. <laughs> Quite frustrated. And shortly after, Philip falls seriously ill. And against Anna's wishes, he is rushed into hospital by his mother. His mother insists that he goes into hospital. Anna's there going, no, he's fine. He's <laughs> fine. He'll be fine. The mother's going, no, he's going into hospital. He needs some echinacea and some weak lemonade and dry toast. He'll be fine. All will be well. He does, thankfully, recover from his mystery illness. Mm. But from this point on, Philip is entirely convinced that his wife does indeed have it in for him and the distrust between the couple grows and grows and grows until eventually they go no can't be doing with this and they actually separate they go their separate ways yeah. philip has probably escaped has had a lucky escape but anna is delighted she is free from that damn bakery none of that anymore <laughs> don't have to be up at four in the morning yeah. taking in sacks of flour or delivering bread to people <laughs> hurrah but i do need some cash for, for one thing her her gambling habit is starting to mount up a little oh, bit oh she's a gambler now is she yeah she she's it's not as easy as she thought to to earn a living at the bookies so she's starting to <laughs> she's starting to struggle slightly so yeah definitely needs to bring in some cash you mean she didn't have a system she did well i think she did have a system it wasn't, wasn't a very good system oh she had two things she had a system and a good feeling about things which <laughs> always works out yeah she had some lucky horse names that's what she had and it did not go well the area Anna lived in Cincinnati was the heart of the German community and she came to notice that there were an awful lot of elderly German men around who didn't really have any family or anyone to look after. These men had been part of the first wave of immigration to, to the US mm. and they had worked incredibly hard all their life mm. to build up a little nest egg to keep them comfortable in old age. Good for them. Anna had encountered many of these men with, at the time at the bakery. They would come in for their loaves or their rolls or whatever it may be. <laughs> And at the time, Anna thought they were nothing but a nuisance. But now, they could be a gold mine. Mm. She takes up a very seemingly honourable position of a living nurse for these, these elderly men. And they would, in fact, welcome the company. It's yeah. nice to have someone else around. And also, they know Anna from her time at the bakery. They oh. maybe even feel a bit sorry for her. She's now... She's a single woman now. Husband's, in fact, has left her. She's got a young son to look after. Oh. So perhaps they feel a bit, yeah, a bit sorry for her, trying to help her out. You can imagine that they've been coming into the bakery and trying to have... They're lonely and they just wanted some yeah, conversation absolutely. after having the loaf of yeah. bread. And she's probably youngish and she's someone who's serving the mm. bread, trying to chat. And she's like, oh, go away. And now she's playing the poor widow and she comes out, oh, those poor old men, they just wanted yeah. some company. They, yeah, absolutely. I mean, she has absolutely no prior experience as a sort of caregiver. But she <laughs> charms her way um, into these men's homes and soon initiates her very deadly plan. Oh, God. It's, a, it's astonishing at this time how little, zero qualifications were needed just to come oh, in and absolutely. go, I will nurse you back to health. What are your qualifications? I have breasts. And I'm very good at the comforting <laughs> with them. You are hired. <laughs> oh, God. So her first job is with Ernst Koch, a widower mm -hmm. in his mm -hmm. 70s. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, we can't just gloss over the <laughs> Ernest Koch there. <laughs> oh, well, I was going to, because that's his name. And she picked that one out first. <laughs> he had no prior medical issues. In fact, I mean, those who knew him described him as sprightly. But all this changes under Anna's tender and loving care. Hmm. Now, we, we do not know if he ever noticed the missing valuables from around his, his home. Mm. Um, his dear wife's diamonds. A pawn to fiend Anna's gambling addiction. Oh, the bitch. The diamonds! Diamonds! Well, there we go. I was ah. wondering if you were going to get that there. <laughs> this is where you slip it in there. But yeah, all the yeah, diamonds. Yeah, yeah. She took the diamonds to feed her yeah. habit. Ugh. And she is indeed a black diamond. Oh, I like it. Mm, indeed. Mm. But I mean, he is far too busy lying in bed, vomiting. Oh, God. Clutching his stomach. Horrendous diarrhea. I mean, he doesn't notice much of what's going on around him, really. <laughs> no. He's really, he's he's in a bad way. You're not going to be able to fight them off as well. You know, you can, if someone's taking all your shit around you while you're, that's going on, you can be protesting. They're like going, just say words if you don't mind me taking away this entire jewellery <laughs> box. No, you seem fine. I'm out. You're fine. You're fine with it. Let's let's go with that. 
Now, unfortunately, Ernst Koch dies on May the 6th, 1933. But though not before generously, very generously, changing his will and leaving his whole house to Anna. Wow. (laughs) (laughs) Which is which is good going, really. That's very convenient. Yeah, and very generous. Yes, very generous and very kind to this person who has only literally come into his life in the last five minutes. It's been like a, a month, six weeks or so. That, that she's she's been there. Mm. She did a bang up job of curing him. Well, she's not there to cure him. She's there to look after him in his in his old age. Again, bang up job. But well, yeah, he's, she's doing really well at this. So well. <laughs> From there, she goes to take care of Albert Parker, a retired railway worker. Albert was a kind man and agreed to loan Anna a thousand dollars for the care of poor dear Oscar, her son. And she signed an IOU saying, "Yes, I will repay your." kindness um, as soon as possible i mean that is as good as money when he dies the iou that anna has signed that albert meticulously kept in his desk conveniently vanishes never to be seen (gasps) again what was it on disappearing ink what a surprise what a surprise Yes, yes yes next she sets her sights on jacob wagner Jacob was uh, 78 years old and perhaps not quite as sharp as he had been in his youth. Anna persuaded the, the rather confused old man that she is in fact a long lost niece come all the way from the old country <laughs> to help look after him in his dotage. That's good. He goes along with it. He goes, yes, absolutely. Come on in. <laughs> How are your parents? <laughs> haven't seen you in years. We haven't had that yet. We haven't had people posing, just rocking up to an old yep. man going, I'm your niece. Yep. Oh, you must come in. Come in, have some tea. Let me get this straight. Who are you again? Yeah. I am your great grandniece. Your great grandfather was a composer. It's fine. All of this is good. Where do you keep all of your jewels slash money. Where are the valuables? My dear uncle. Well, the cash ends up in her pocket because when he dies two months later, he leaves his entire estate worth (gasps) $17,000 to his beloved niece, Anna. This is... Oh, my God. What? $17,000. So I've got to assume... cash. So, so can we assume here with these people, they don't have any living relatives? Absolutely, yeah. And that's something we'll come to in a minute. Give me two seconds and we'll come to that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. I'm jumping the gun here. I'm jumping, I'm jumping the, the gun. gun. But, but, but she's she's rocking up because it's the urban legend, isn't it? It's the idea that if you, oh, I stumbled into this old man's funeral and I signed my name in the guest book and he left me a million pounds because he said, if anyone came to my funeral, I would leave them my fortune. So the idea <laughs> of that these lonely old men, they just want someone to care for them and she's showing up on the doorstep very convenient he, th- but they don't have any living relatives well absolutely tell, tell all uh, so i mean she she's incredibly careful with her crime she always covers her tracks very well and she selects her victims carefully as we were just saying they don't have families the, the, right. most of them are never married or are widowers there's no one who's going to come questioning about if a will has has changed there's no one's going to contest it if someone dies unexpectedly there's no one who's going to query it they are generally men alone in the world sort of thing oh. um and those are the people she she focuses on. There's no one who's going to come and question the will saying, I've got a claim to it. Exactly. It's so stupid. But yeah, there's no one who's going to have more of a claim than a distant relative. Absolutely, yeah. And it's, they he's, they seemingly have legitimate wills and something has been left to the, the dear Anna who's been caring for them. No one's going to question it. And I mean, also, as we have come across in many times before, old people die. <laughs> Shut up. No, you know, what? If there's an easy explanation... No one is making a fuss no. about questioning it why. The doctor or the coroner did not look too far into the case. It just got signed and under the radar and, and dealt with. Old people die. People people there die. happens to be a relative. And if that person ha- is happily clearing up and being the executor and going, no, 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 I'll take the body and I'll take care of all the paperwork. It's one less inconvenience, isn't it? Mm-hmm. For the state. Absolutely. Oh. It's another no. case that while she was caring for a chap called George Gellersman, she makes off with fifteen thousand dollars before his <gasps> death hell. in July nineteen thirty seven. So she's she is minted. really raking in the cash. Though there is God. there is one case where she's perhaps not as careful as she has thought she had been with a chap called George Heiss. I mean, maybe she's grown a bit too confident in her methods. One afternoon, George's new nurse, Anna, brings him a lovely mug of root beer. After nice. after Anna leaves the room, Heiss notices that a, that a fly has perched on the side of the mug um, to take a drink, drink from the from the beer. <laughs> okay. The fly promptly falls off the mug dead. Um, <laughs> 
um, George, slightly alarmed by this yes. this um, development, <laughs> calls Anna into the room and she promptly tries mm-hmm. to snatch the mug away from him, perhaps realising that has she been rumbled? By a fly. By a fly. <laughs> oh, things. That's always a good sign. Always dip a fly in your drink in the club to make sure that you're not being poisoned. A, t- a tip for all here. Carry a fly <laughs> upon you. She outright refuses to take a sip of the drink as George is trying to say, well, you try it. You try, you try this. She goes, no. George no. promptly and, and wisely dismisses Anna from his service. Good for him. Unfortunately, George never raises the alarm with the police and never tells anyone about this incident. Um, and Anna is back out on the look for her next victim you've got to think what has she been doing for these guys as well maybe as well as being a nurse maybe there's been something a little bit close uh, between them and they don't want to raise that they don't want to if she's still alive and they're still alive and he's saying oh she tried to poison me well she could say all sorts of allegations against him yeah well, maybe that's why he doesn't raise it may, may, maybe maybe yeah that mm. is indeed a possibility i'm writing down loads of notes on this so i'm just like <laughs> yeah i'm gonna crack this case <laughs> So she's on the lookout for her next victim. She finds 67-year-old George Obendorfer. Now, this perhaps is her most elaborate plan yet. Um, In the summer of 1937, Anna convinces Obendorfer that they should take a trip to Colorado Springs. It's going to do him the world of good to get away from the city smog, the clean mountain air. It's going to be lovely and delightful. And George goes, yes, absolutely. Why the hell not? And George, Anna and her son Oscar take the trip and they check into the Park Hotel on the 30th of July that year. The following day, George is discovered unconscious in his hotel room and rushed into hospital. The doctors do all they can, but they are unable to diagnose this mystery illness that has apparently come on so swiftly and severely. And on the 1st of August, George dies at Memorial Hospital. Ooh, bad trip. Well, well, indeed, a very, very swift exit. Now, the hospital, obviously concerned by this sudden and unknown death, contact the local authorities and go, something weird's happening here. And they start (laughs) to look into this unexplained death. They visit the hotel and discover that George was visiting from Cincinnati and he's only checked in a few days before with a Mrs. Han and her young son. Hmm. Now, Mrs. Han and the boy are are nowhere to be found, and only George's luggage is found in the hotel room. Suspicions are further aroused as the police find that the owner of the hotel has just that morning filed a report about the theft of $300 worth of diamonds from another (gasps) guest room. Diamonds again! More diamonds! More diamonds! <laughs> oh, well, she she made use of her stay, Absolutely. She? she? like She made full use of the facilities yes, of the precisely, hotel. precisely, absolutely so. Now, the police start searching the area for any sign of this missing woman or the missing diamonds. And in a, in a nearby pawn shop, the owner tells them that, that a woman, accompanied by a young boy had tried to pawn some jewels earlier that day. Mm-hmm. But he came, He became suspicious at the woman's... She was in such a desperate hurry for, for the cash <laughs> that he, he thought, no, something's, something's not right yet, and he refuses to make the deal. And the description he gave matched the description of Anna Hand given by the hotel staff perfectly. Oh, my goodness. Now, as they expand their search, they find that a woman um, had tried to withdraw $1,000 from a Denver bank using a Cincinnati bank book in the name of George Obendorfer. Oh God, the, she's been busy. So she, yeah, she's getting around the place. The, the mm. woman had claimed to be Mrs. Obendorfer, but she has no proof of ID or anything like that, just her, supposedly her husband's bank book. But the bank manager goes, no, 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 none of this, and refused to, <laughs> refuses to make the transaction. Oh, she's, that's, that shows the desperation, isn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. She's trying to cash stuff, she's trying to get as much money as she can as quickly as possible. Precisely so. Now, while these investigations are going on, the hospital is conducting their own investigation into, on George George's body and during the autopsy <laughs> that's called an autopsy <laughs> yeah I got there in the end I think a body investigation is much more exciting it's, it's not that we're walking around with deer stalker hats on with pipes poking the body with the pipe going yes it appears that he is dead an investigation must be launched I think you find they were dust him for prints <laughs> <laughs> they don't find a print but what they do find is a massive dose of arsenic in arsenic alarm body. Arsenic alarm! Arsenic alarm! There it is! There it is. (laughs) Now, detectives are convinced that Anna is entirely responsible for for George's death and the theft at the hotel. The detectives in charge of the body investigation. Yes, absolutely. Those those detectives. Absolutely. The body detectives, they are... The the body (laughs) detectives. 
did. They are convinced that she is most likely heading home to Ohio, to Cincinnati. And they contact the Cincinnati authorities, who are there, and they wait for Anna's return with arrest warrants in hand. Imagine about the train station going, oh, she's coming, oh, she's a coming. Um, <laughs> Wait, she's coming in the other one? Run! Yes, oh, there's, there's two. Ah. We forgot we had two train stations. <laughs> they really did. They had to stand with the arrest warrant in hand. Yeah, I've got a bit of paper saying I can arrest you. I can arrest you. It says that literally scrawled in crayon. Yeah, signed by a judge. It's very official. <laughs> <laughs> when they eventually pick her up from whichever train station it may have been, they, they ask her about George. Um, she responds, the man is a perfect stranger to me. <laughs> when Rich. reminded that she has signed the hotel register with, with him, <laughs> she changes her story and claims that, well, he was a Swiss gentleman and they had met on the train and she said she felt sorry for him and she was only trying to help so they thought they would split the cost of a hotel room just to help him along a bit what um (laughs) that's a bad story it's a bad story again the detectives point out that well we know he was from cincinnati so we've spoken to some neighbors and they've told us that you've been in the house a lot (laughs) <laughs> um, <laughs> you're, you're a frequent visitor at George's right again she comes out with that with a third story good, okay good. yes yes she did know him uh, but it was entirely by chance that they met on the train going on holiday to, to the same place entire coincidence um, and okay. only once they discovered this this happy coincidence did they then decide to split the cost of a hotel room and it was all very coincidental did- Okay, when we're saying split the cost of a hotel room, is this some sort of euphemism that she was saying they shacked up together? Oh, in the I hotel mean, the most, room? De- most definitely, I think with George, there was a shack in a plenty. Yeah, or, yeah, I think that she had that with, with his arrangement. Is she trying to say that to the authorities, saying, oh, we decided to split the cost of a hotel room to try and imply that there was some liaison there that she didn't want to really reveal? I mean, it's just stupid. Well, it's just stupid. Sorry. It is just stupid, considering <laughs> she's, got her, she's got her young son in tow as well. Yeah. It's, what through, throughout this whole situation so it's like Mwah. there's many a time that i've taken a train journey and i've met someone and said let's just split the cost of a hotel room yeah. together no funny business you've met a swiss gentleman in a, in I a carriage I, I long for the day <laughs> absolutely and you say well twin twin bedrooms twin beds exactly we will we'll split the room save a bit of cash no shenanigans going on whatsoever <laughs> up in the morning go your separate ways <laughs> <laughs> This is weird. <laughs> like all the detectives are going, okay, we, we would think this weird if you hadn't killed him anyway. We'd still be going, yeah. were you having sex with this man? Were you having sex? We are having a sex with him and then you killed him. <laughs> you don't need to do this elaborate ruse, honestly. <laughs> now, despite her excellent, excellent... <laughs> Lies. Alibis that she, she's, got, she's got going on, um, the detectives are indeed able to get a search warrant for Anna's home. One detective comments that they found enough poison to kill half of Cincinnati. What? <laughs> Just lying around. Just one grain of strychnine. <laughs> <laughs> they all also discover the IOU written out to Albert Parker for a thousand dollars that she assigned. Now, why the fuck she would keep such a thing, I do not know. She's clearly an idiot. Well, there yeah. is that. Yeah. <laughs> As they dug further into Anna's past, they find out about all the inheritances that have been left mm. to her by so many of her old patients. Details start to appear in the local papers about these these newly suspicious deaths. One of these articles reaches the hand of George Heiss, the chap who was saved by the fly, and he realises <laughs> what a close call that he had and contacts the police to tell his story at that point. George and the fly have shacked up together. They have actually <laughs> married. The fly is dead. The fly is <laughs> long dead. He resuscitated it after she left. Ah, <laughs> uh, okay. Lovingly. Lovingly. You saved my life. You saved fly. my life. <laughs> now my life is yours. I owe my life. He has spent the rest of his life dedicated to saving flies wherever they go. It was a delightful time. In the apartment building of Jacob Wagner, um, the man who left everything to his beloved yes. niece, they found Olive Luella Kohler. Olive remembered Anna quite well. They had been great friends mm. when she had been visiting with Jacob, um, though she did remember an occasion where Anna had bought her an ice cream cone and that she had become so ill after eating it that she had been taken into hospital. And it just so happens that during that hospital, say, someone broke into her apartment and stole all her diamond jewellery. Oh, good God. <laughs> and for some reason, Olive hadn't put put all these things together until that point well you wouldn't would you someone's bought you an ice cream cone you're just really grateful someone's brought you ice cream and someone you know and someone you trust and you've seen a lot around the building now investigators are now entirely convinced that anna has been poisoning her elderly patients and been doing it for many many years
years. And they are able to arrange the exhumations of George Gellersman and Jacob Wagner on this evidence. Now, during the autopsy of Gellersman, they discover a poison that they initially thought to be arsenic. But on further testing, they discover it to be croton oil. What? A new poison that we have not had before, we so that's exciting. We haven't covered croton oil. Sounds croton oil. amazing. Croton oil. That sounds like something that repels Superman and also powers cars. So deadly, deadly, if anything. Croton <laughs> oil. Oh, I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited to hear about it. Croton oil is extracted from the croton tree um, that is native to India. Oh. Um, it is taken from the seeds of the tree. In small doses, it was used um, to treat constipation. Oh, oh, oh. It tended to tended to loosen things. Mm-hmm. However, in large doses, it causes uh, burning in the mouth, throat, stomach, m- much vomiting of blood, uh, diarrhea, including lots of blood as including well, including the intestines, including most of the bodily organs going out, um, and it leads to a desperately unpleasant oh, death. Oh goodness! During the Second World War, the the U.S. Navy added croton oil to torpedo fuel to stop sailors drinking the fuel. <laughs> okay, that's a lot to unpack. Because <laughs> the, the fuel was sort of ethanol-based yeah. in a sort of alcohol way. And, and they thought to make strength. this unpalatable, <laughs> yeah. to make this unpalatable to sailors, we will add the croton oil to yeah. make it that unpleasant. So you'll shit yourself to death if you drink this. I well, mean, eth- hopefully ethanol you... is not going to be a pleasant drink as it is. Well, a bit of, bit of lime, it's grand. <laughs> So it's unpleasant stuff, but has many uses, especially in torpedoes. Now, a pharmacist later confirms that Anna has indeed purchased croton oil on the 20th of July, 1936. He has it all written down in his very nice book. For all her torpedo plans. She is well prepared. In the case of Jacob Wagner, they find good old fashioned arsenic. Yeah. It's not as exciting, but it's a classic. Anna is arrested for the murder of Jacob Wagner on the 10th of August, 1937. Despite the overwhelming evidence of multiple, multiple murders, the authorities decided to go one at a time. If this one didn't stick, they'll try with the next one. If that yeah. one didn't stick, they'll try with the one after that. And each one in turn until they got her. The trial starts on the 11th of October in front of a jury of 11 women and one man, which is a curious Interesting. Split. Now, the, the prosecution unleashed a barrage of witnesses, um, hospital employees who testified to Wagner's last agonizing days, chemists that, who confirmed that he had enough arsenic in his system to kill four grown men, hmm? uh, a handwriting expert who tells the court that Wagner's will is a forgery and the writing is identical to Anna's. The judge even allows the other murders to be shown as evidence um, evidence of a pattern oh. of homicidal behaviour. Okay. I mean, even though she's not on trial or convicted of any of the others. You're not supposed to bring that into it. You're not supposed to have any past convictions or any other cases that are active. You have to be tried only yeah. on that case that's in hand. The judge goes for it and says, yeah, bring it on. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah. Look at all the other uh, the, shit she did. Exactly. The more the better. Now, the defence has nothing in rebuttal. <laughs> and all they, all they have is Anna on the stand going, no, it wasn't me. I didn't do it. They've opened up their briefcase going, well, I think you'll find it in the briefcase. <laughs> there's just one sheet of paper and an apple. And the, on the sheet of paper is written, just lie. Yeah. <laughs> in his closing arguments, the prosecutor lets rip, describing Anna as the coldest, most heartless, cruel person that has ever come with in the scope of our lives he has a very dramatic flair uh, which i very much approve of i have to say and he says in the four corners of this courtroom stand four dead men gellersman mm. palmer wagner and obendorfer from the four corners bony fingers point at her and say <gasps> that woman poisoned me that woman made my last moments an agony that woman tortured me with the tortures of the damned <laughs> is excellent i love it <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Just throws the paper in the air, yep. saunters back to his chair very quietly, sits down, defence stands up, yep. shuffling <laughs> blank pages. You, you can imagine that he's got like a whole tech team behind him. There's somewhere there with some dry ice throwing that in as well. <laughs> <laughs> really get the mood going. Oh yeah, he's got like spotlights that come on like boom, boom. Boom, boom, in all four corners. It's great, it's great. It's re- it looks really good. <laughs> and then he ruins it at the end with a glitter cannon or something like that. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, you can never ruin anything with a glitter cannon. <laughs> boom. <laughs> the jury take two hours to decide her guilt. I think mainly that was sandwich One, one hour, 59 minutes. <laughs> sandwiches one minute she guilty <laughs> and come back with a verdict of guilty with no recommendation for mercy now without this recommendation the judge is left with only one option Jeff. death 
Anna Marie Han was to be the first woman executed in the state of Ohio. Oh, in the state of Ohio. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, not in the world ever. <laughs> I, did, I wasn't going to say that. <laughs> no. We very much know that wasn't the case. <laughs> first woman ever to be executed in the state of Ohio. In the state of Ohio. Um, <laughs> she is transferred to Ohio State Penitentiary while her lawyers keep up the appeals. <laughs> oh, based on what? Well, based on going, well, no, that's not right. Uh, it all comes to nothing. Our glitter cannon didn't go off. It's not fair. <laughs> we only had three spotlights. They had four. It's not fair. <laughs> Tuesday the 6th of December 1938, Ohio Governor Martin Davey makes a statement refusing to interfere with the decision of the courts. Anna's execution is sentenced for 8pm the next day. She spends much of the next day writing four letters that were handed to her lawyers before she is marched to the electric chair. (gasps) She is pronounced dead at 813 Oh, she really does go to the chair. Okay, Okay. She goes to the chair. She goes to the chair. And in some accounts, there are actually quite vivid details of her on the chair which i decided to issue they're out there if you want to see them but it's quite (laughs) go look them up if you want to if you really want to but they're out there she does indeed she is indeed executed in the following days her lawyers announce that the the letters that she has written before her death have been sold to the cincinnati inquirer no yeah well i know under her her express uh, wishes okay. that that was that was the case oh. um and the, the the money is to be used to help her son oh, oscar. the profits from this go to dear oscar oh, God. um oscar is in fact placed with a foster family far away from ohio but true to their word the newspaper pays for his education oh. um, and never reveal his new name or his whereabouts at all no. and he is left entirely out of yeah out of the way and out of sight Wow. Over four days, the newspapers publish Anna's full confession. And these letters are available online, should anyone wish to should wish to read them. But they are desperately sad. Telling of a woman who, who knows she has done terrible things, yeah. but just doesn't understand why or how she was capable of of them and i'm going to read you an excerpt from the from her last letter okay and then i will cry oh do, oh, we'll do we need to brace to... ourselves here oh i drank all my drinks okay okay all right all right <laughs> i'll clutch the glass in a, in a pious manner i don't know you'll you'll laugh maniacally um, all the way through jesus um, okay <laughs> there were times in the courtroom the times that the newspaper wrote that i seemed to be worried that i was just about to cry out i was just about ready to cry out i could hardly keep my secret in me it seemed that I would have to cry out. I wanted to cry that they were trying the other Anna Han and not this one sitting in the courtroom. Somehow I kept the secret. I hope that God will take care of my son, for I would not want anything to happen to my boy. I feel that God has shown me my wrongs in life, and only my only regret is that I have not the power to undo the trouble and heartache that I have caused. No. No, no, not not tugging at your tugging at your strength. No, there. no, I don't, I don't buy it. Ugh, yes, maybe you can reform and maybe you can have a change of ways and you can look back on the stuff that you've done with great regret and go, my God, what kind of frame of mind have I been in? Usually, that's if you've done something a little bit bad once in your life. If you've repeatedly <laughs> killed people and then planned their deaths, uh, no, 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 no sympathy there, no sympathy. Uh, own <laughs> up enough, to it. No own sympathy. up to it. And, and which she did. She, that she did indeed. Yeah, but she owned up saying it was another person. It was another version of her. No, okay. Well, I, perhaps I've chosen the wrong exit. You read <laughs> the letters. <laughs> I may, I may have mischosen my quotes. Um, well, maybe. But she does indeed. Very, yeah. she very much confesses. If you read, I oh, sorry, I read them all, and they were ugh, uh, quite, quite sad. But she does indeed confess that yes, I did all these things, and it is a terrible thing that I have done. Um, and she does entirely own up to it and admit what she has what she has done that's fair enough i suppose really if you've read all the confessions yeah i mean there was no doubt that she killed yeah at least four there were Mm. there were potential one case i one account i read that she was suspected of up to 13 god there was i think it was only in one account that that they had a number that high but it was definitely at least four um four that she confessed to in her letters but people suspect potentially more wow so there's the the sad and terrifying case of <laughs> Anna Marie Han. Anna Marie Han, da da da, famous case. What a story! <laughs> no, is it? So is it a sad case? I I don't know. I'm I'm in two minds. When I read some of her letters, I I was actually surprisingly moved. Mm by what she what she had written where she said yeah absolutely it was it was me and i'm really sorry 
for what I've done. It's terrible. I don't know why I did it, but I did mm. it. And then her main concern seems to be for the welfare of her, her son. And credit to you, you know. That's... I mean, everyone is able to reform and everyone, you know, if you're on your deathbed, yes, you're going to be ushered along to thinking, wow, I really need to make amends here. I can I can empathise with that. I remember seeing a, a documentary about people who were on death row in America very recently. Um, and there was one there was one account from one prisoner who was talking to his parole board knowing that he was going to go and he was saying, I should be put to death. And he was very mm. passionately talking about how he was responsible and acknowledging what he had done. He had found mm. God and that was what had helped him along. And I remember watching that and being so moved by someone going really vehemently, I am responsible, I must take responsibility for what I have done. Yeah. Maybe to the parents of the people he had killed, they wouldn't be so sympathetic. Maybe well, absolutely, yeah, indeed. I think for the for people who are so closely involved, you'd be going, "I don't give a fuck." What yeah, you, you killed X, Y, and Z. That's. <laughs> I think it's good that she did repent at the end, and that she did yes. really try to confess and tried to find a way to protect my son and give him some money because, well, y- you get desperate, but you probably shouldn't have killed all those fucking people. Quite well, frankly, I mean, absolutely, yeah. I mean, no, no matter what she wrote at the end and things like that, though that still remains that she killed at least four people. Yeah, um, and there is there is no excusing that, whatever the situation. Maybe I'm being really harsh in judging it because we've had loads of terrible killers on our hands, and we've laughed and we've joked about it. But and maybe it's years of I don't know reporting on some crimes as well when I was a journalist. But it's very very easy to be sad when you've been caught and to be repentant when you're about to go to jail and go oh no I'm really sad about it. But you did you weren't you weren't putting that message out in trial were you? You weren't mm. saying I confessed. I'm not going to waste the state's time when there's nothing else left. Oh yeah, actually I did it all. I mean, when you think about it, there, was there any reason for her to write those letters? What's the whole thing? Desperately cynical, and it's a way to get some cash for a son. Yeah, if you if she genuinely seemed to care about her son, then get him I, some cash. I know this is what. Yeah, I know this is what's going to happen. I'm going to die tomorrow. So, what is the best way that I can look after my son and get him some money? Yeah, I'll write these things down. No one's going to pay for a thing going. I fucking didn't do it. <laughs> no one's going to pay for that. Yeah, very cynical. So that's now, very aren't we? cynical. That's an incredibly cynical way of looking at it, which is uh, possible. It's possible, and and our listeners are real true crime fans. You you guys out there probably listen to far more podcasts and know so many cases, even beyond our ken as well. What do you think about? You know, we're getting into the modern the media actually around some of these cases. What do you think about this? Do you think that she was being cynical at the end? Maybe there are other cases that you want to cite precedent on. So we've got people who have suddenly confessed right at the end. Is it cynical or is it really a moment where they're trying to claw back some humanity? That's the dark side of this. But still, what <laughs> a killer. I mean, she was ballsy. She was ballsy. And how oh, many people yeah, she I mean, rocked up to yeah. the house? I'm a nurse. Qualifications? None. OK, come in. <laughs> Did I say nurse? I meant your great niece. <laughs> <laughs> What am I? Nurse, niece, nurse, niece. niece. Yeah, I have a stutter. It's 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 fine. Yeah, is that, I'm German. The accent makes it all sound the same. Um. You're German too, am I? Yes, you're senile. Go with me on this. Oh, I know. And I did write down again. This is sad. Again, I feel a bit sad saying this, but yeah, all those old fellas who who, yeah, as we said, came into the bakery and saw her. If she had gotten them to change their will, was it a bit of they genuinely wanted to give her the money or were they just a bit of, you know what, someone may as well have it. I know she's trying to kill me. Mm. I know she's being horrible. Fine. Take what you want and I'll go. And just feeling that despondent at the end. That's a very bleak way of putting well, that, it. That's... That's an incredibly bleak. I think one. it's sort of a um, little bit of alluding to some 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 classic novels I've read, actually, where it's like, hey, oh god, that's horrible. Oh, but those poor lonely men. Leave the men alone. They just wanted their bread. They just wanted their baguettes. Yeah. Well, now we're all thoroughly depressed. I know. Yeah. That. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really really good story, and yeah, the balls of her getting diamonds from everyone while I'm killing someone in this hotel. May as well raid another room. May as well find some diamonds. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Make the most of it. I I think that's it but that's that's why i think she was cynical at the end she exploited every opportunity that she could this is very true god damn that's it very true well enough of us talking about it what do you think people 
please weigh in with your thoughts on this. We've gotten into a nice little hot debate about, you know, deathbed or death row confessions. So what do you think? Do you think she was really repentant at the end? Do you think she was a completely mercenary throughout? Do you feel sad for her? Do you know the case? Do you know more of the stories? Have you read the letters that Nick has alluded to? Would you steal someone's diamonds if the opportunity arose? They're very, very sparkly. Who wouldn't? I mean, who wouldn't? Yeah. Go for the sparkly thing. If you're committing um, a crime, do you tack on another crime at the same time just to get some jewellery? <laughs> well, you, I mean, you're there already, so... <laughs> yeah. Do people think that, like, I've killed this person, it, well, in for a penny, in for a pound? Well, I suppose, I think if you kill someone, then fuck yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, exactly. it's like... This is very much the lesser of two evils. Yeah, exactly. It's not going to get worse than this. So if I take something sparkly, then... <laughs> you're caught stealing after there's a dead body in your room. You're like, oh, the stealing. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, uh, don't, obviously, people. Yeah, well, We're not don't, advocating. Don't, do don't, don't do something and then do a bigger crime to cover the smaller crime that you just commit. Just don't commit any crimes. <laughs> but what you should do is make some lovely, lovely cocktail. Make some, instead of stealing some diamonds, make a diamond, black diamond cocktail. And let us know what you think. The recipe will be out on Friday and it'll be delightful for all. These are the bad decisions we can get on board with. And escalate them by all means. While you're there, make that other bad decision. No one will judge you because the cocktails cover everything. And if you haven't already, make sure you come and join us on Patreon. For but $5 a month or the equivalent currency, wherever you are, come and talk to us if you would like to have any information about Patreon. There are new episodes every week. We're putting out some new bonus content very soon. We have got lots on there and lots more to come from your favourite podcast because we are your favourites. Absolutely. How can we not be? Thanks for listening, guys. We have been the people inside the Poisoner's Cabinet. We will see you next week. And remember, your loved ones are trying to kill you. Bye.